Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Shamini Salvaratnam. Thank you for joining us today for the launch of the Linking Global Finance to Small Scale Clean Energy Report. It comes at a crucial time as the world is both falling behind on our energy access goals and facing an energy crisis. The UNDP's climate aggregation platform is a global environment facility funded project to promote the scale up of aggregation of small scale clean energy in developing countries. It led the development of this report along with the Climate Bonds Initiative. To share the key findings of the report, we convened the UNDP task team leaders, lead author, and expert contributors for a discussion and to present the findings. To start us off, I want to invite Stephanie Held, the director of UNDP's Sustainable Energy Hub to deliver opening remarks. Stephanie is curious about the interconnectedness of complex systems and what sustainable energy, climate change, and leaving no one behind really mean to people and societies. She has a keen interest in working collaboratively to increase access to clean and affordable energy for 500 million more people and deliver outcomes at the nexus of strategy, technology, policy, and finance. She has extensive experience in public and private sector organizations where she held progressively senior energy and climate related posts. Most recently, before joining the UNDP, she led UNECE's sustainable energy work, developing pathways to sustainable energy and attaining carbon neutrality, specifically focusing on de decarbonizing energy intensive industries in UNECE's 56 mem member countries. Welcome Stephanie, over to you. Yes, hello everybody, and it's a pleasure to be here and to introduce this um, interesting event for you. Right, so um, climate impacts, exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic and the current energy crisis, continue to mount. That's why we're here, right? Never has it been more important to take action together at an accelerated pace and scale. All this to transition to affordable, renewable, and sustainable energy sources that leave no one behind. That's important for us. Looking at the latest tracking SDG 7 progress report, the world is not on track to achieving sustainable development goals, specifically number seven energy. If the current pace persists, only 92% of the world's population will be electrified by 2030. And 2.5 billion people will be left with no access to clean cooking. This is boring for us. And the world's energy and climate future increasingly hinge on decisions made in emerging and developing economies. We desperately need to ramp up the deployment of clean energy solutions that have the potential to deliver universal energy access and economic development. Together, we believe that access to clean energy, specifically when it supports the productive uses of energy, has the transformational power to advance socioeconomic development and reduce inequalities, including in and especially in times of fragility and crisis. But uh, clearly investments in clean energy have not followed the already ambitious goals for energy access. Achieving the energy goals for the 2030 agenda requires extremely ambitious measures. And there's now a critical need for innovative financing mechanisms that can crowd in blended finance to help address this investment gap. And that's why it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, because we are together in this meeting because of our long-standing partnerships with Climate Bonds Initiative. Together now, we are launching a report prepared as part of the climate aggregation platform that my colleague Shamini has just mentioned. This report highlights the potential of financial aggregation, its challenges and enablers. Financial aggregation is such an innovation that can unlock new sources of capital for clean energy projects in developing countries. It has the potential to unlock, unlock new sources of capital investments for small scale distributed energy projects and businesses in developing countries. And uh, you've already heard about what the climate aggregation platform is, it's a flagship project for UNDP Sustainable Energy Hub, which I represent here, and it is a Jeff funded project, like I was mentioned. Um, the platform is working to, to, to create an enabling environment for deploying innovative business models and financial mechanisms to accelerate energy access and the clean energy transition, including regional and country level market assessments. 
The report, I should mention, was produced after an extensive literature review and dozens of interviews with stakeholders, both from the product and the finance perspectives. Now we hope that this report will help catalyze action on financial aggregation and other complementary de-risking mechanisms. For example, concessional finance and guarantees for the deployment and scale of much needed innovative clean energy solutions. And the last word on UNDP, we're certainly committed to increasing energy access for those furthest behind. The Sustainable Energy Hub represents a bold ambition and call to action to support 500 million more people to gain access to clean and affordable energy through our interventions and more importantly, through strategic partnerships as this one. Wishing us very interesting discussions and thank you for participating. And back to you, Shireen. Thank you, Stephanie, for setting the scene with your remarks. Now I'm going to welcome Dan McGree, who is the lead author of the report to present the key findings. Dan is a fellow of the Institute of Faculty of Actuaries UK and a senior research analyst at Climate Bonds. He's authored various research papers on global green and sustainable finance with a focus on helping shift capital towards low carbon resilient societies. Over to you, Dan, to tell us about, you know, tell us what the report is all about. Thanks, Shamini, and good day to everyone. Um, just firstly, uh, Felipe, I believe we could get the slides up now to uh, alongside my presentation. Thank you. Uh, yes, so as Shamini mentioned, my name is Dan. Uh, I'm a research analyst with the Climate Bonds and worked as a part of the team alongside UNDP in terms of putting together this publication. Next slide, please, Felipe. Uh, so firstly, the report was developed as a part of the Climate Aggregation Platform, or the CAP, which, as Stephanie mentioned, explores how financial aggregation is a solution to opening up new financing opportunities for small-scale, low-carbon energy assets in developing countries. It's hoped that by working through the issues at hand, we have the best chance of moving towards the ultimate goal, that is, the establishment of a liquid, liquid capital market that enables large-scale capital flows towards promising small-scale renewable energy initiatives. We reviewed much of the public, uh, publicly available literature relevant to this topic and used this information as foundational knowledge to engage with various different stakeholders to verify what was being documented, actually reflected reality, and is up to date. The stakeholder interviews really provided a tremendous amount of insights in terms of what I am presenting today, which can be seen as really a starting point for further developments in the future. I know that UNDP is looking to build on this and the existing data and insights within the report as a part of the CAP project, and Eduardo will touch on that more later. Next slide, please, Felipe. So a reasonable starting point for um, initiating this discussion is really to take a look at what's meant by financial aggregation. Sometimes uh, it is referred to by different names, but the basic application here is really centering around collecting and combining the financing needs of multiple businesses into a single vehicle or platform. These assets are then packaged into a portfolio within a special purpose vehicle, which can then be utilized to create asset backed securities or ABS to then be sold on to investors. This, in effect, funnels the large scale finance into the small scale enterprises and the arrangement benefits both sides of the financing chain. So for the small scale businesses, this is a new, new sources of finances can emerge. And then for the investors, an ABS portfolio where you purchase these securities can actually have an attractive risk return profile whose performance is relatively uncorrelated to other asset markets. The instruments and the mechanisms that underpin financial aggregation aren't new or terribly complex. However, it's clearly not an approach that has been utilised for small-scale renewables in developing markets. And this report really looks to investigate as to why. Next slide, please, Felipe. A few key themes should probably be acknowledged up front to set the scene on why this is so important. So firstly, further finance is really needed to achieve SDG 7. That is accessible, 
uh, access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. Electricity penetration rates are notably lower in developing countries, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa, which is home to three quarters of this estimated 759 million people who lack access to electricity. Therefore, direct action is needed, not just for access, but also for the financing gap if SDG 7 is to be achieved. Small scale, low carbon energy solutions are vital to achieving universal access and new sources of capital are needed to support these businesses. Our analysis suggests that the existing funding is highly concentrated to a few countries and thus may not be reaching those who are most in need of international support. The sizable energy access deficit matches the size of an opportunity for distributable, distributed renewable energy or DRE alongside other small scale, low carbon energy solutions to address this gap. Elsewhere, you have a thriving sustainable finance market where the volume of thematic or labeled debt has grown considerably over the last decade. Connecting this market with the financing needs of the DRE sector in developing countries spells out an opportunity. And the conduit between this is really an aggregative financing mechanism to stand in between. It's clear that financial aggregation faces a range of barriers, but other ABS markets in developed countries experience similar challenges and have since thrived to become an established asset class today. There is evidence to suggest that enablers are starting to emerge in developing countries that may see this progress in the very near term. Next slide, please, Felipe. The full scope of small scale, low carbon energy solutions extends to several subsectors. Solar home systems are the dominant technology in the off grid sector, despite many of these companies failing to reach profitability. Mini grids also play an essential role in increasing electrification rates, but are at an, at an early stage of market development and attract comparatively less finance to their solar home systems equivalent. Clean Cooking applications hold great promise, but attract limited funding, mainly due to lack of policy support for the industry, but also some degree of affordability constraints for the products themselves. The top 10 off-grid solar companies attract 87% of global funding today, but with most of the capitals, capital flowing into PAYGO companies. It's mostly the other 13% that is the focus really of what we're talking about with financial aggregation. But in general, financing large numbers of small scale businesses in developing countries is challenging. And these challenges aren't necessarily unique to energy. Each subsector is at a varying various degrees of market development and their financing needs really need to reflect this reality. The varying size and the maturity of each company within the DRE umbrella suggests that a one size fits all approach to financing is unlikely to succeed. Next slide, please, Felipe. A study of the financing landscape is consistent with some of the earlier observations I made. Investments in the DRE sector have grown considerably in the last decade, but it is yet to reach maturity. For example, Cumulative investment in off-grid solar technology stood at around 2 billion US dollars in 2020, while roughly 50 billion US dollars in global clean energy investment is required each year to achieve universal electrification. In Africa, only one to 2% of electricity finance flows to distributed renewables. And there's an estimated 200 billion US dollar market opportunity for investors to achieve universal access, energy access by 2030, a large part through distributed renewables. Solar home systems received most of the funding with PAYGO companies taking the lion's share of off-grid renewable financing. And then in terms of energy access, an estimated 420 million people are served by off-grid solar products globally with capacity in off-grid renewables more than doubling since 2009. It's anticipated that the sector will continue to grow at around 6% each year over the next 10 years. Next slide, please, Felipe. At present, the sizable market opportunity isn't translating into green debt. While Africa has 23% of official climate finance, 
It has less than 1% of global green bond issuances. Renewable energy investment make up a sizable portion of the current use of proceeds for green bond in the green bond market. However, only around 2% of cumulative green debt are securitizations backed by renewable energy assets. Most green securitized deals originate in developed markets, suggesting that clear barriers are presenting or preventing this approach from being adopted more broadly in developing countries. Next slide, please, Felipe. Broader consideration is, is generally required when assessing what the obstacles are to financing. And often as a part of doing this report, we have to take a step back and think about this more generally in terms of are these challenges that we're facing something that is specific to financial aggregation and securitization or are these more general issues related to financing small to medium enterprises in developing countries or are the issues actually related specifically to funding distributed renewable this report divides up between general barriers, which are considered challenges to SME financing in developing countries, and specific barriers, which are those that are more related or more closely related to financial aggregation and distributed renewable energy. Then within the specific barriers, we tried to further divide between the buy side, or which is the investor side, and then the sell side, which can be thought of as those who are receiving the funding out of any aggregated vehicle. Disentangling the effects between each barrier to financing for DRE in developing countries is a profoundly complex undertaking. The barriers listed here are considered the leading issues that need to be addressed if financial aggregation is to reach its full potential as a solution. Next slide, please, Felipe. The enablers featured in the report highlight the immediate opportunities to advance financial aggregation transactions. Data, standardization, and KPIs can deliver necessary information for the buy side to isolate investable, investable projects that match their desired risk return profiles. The flow of information and the quantification of business metrics help streamline due diligence processes and increase transparency around the risk return prospects. This needs to be supported by a sufficient number of investable opportunities that can then be bundled collectively to create the ticket sizes demanded and also justify the transaction costs incurred by investors. Creating an open-ended revolving vehicle connecting multiple buy-side and sell-side actors could serve as the basis for credit enhancement products that support both the, the sell-side and attract new potential sources of finance, such as climate-first investors. Such a facility could also be complemented through carbon credits and distributed renewable energy certificates or DRECs. Next slide, please, Felipe. In the insight section of the report, we adapted a version of the CAPM into the context of this conversation to illustrate the interaction between barriers, enablers and financing rates. The graphical representation plots investment risk on the X axis with investors required rate of return on the vertical axis. The market line depicts the minimum rate investors require to accept the underlying investment risk in any particular opportunity. The required rate of return is the primary driver for the high lending rates currently offered in the DRE sector. Lenders will incorporate a an additional contingency margin and higher lending rates if there's any degree of uncertainty around potential returns. By tackling some of the highlighted barriers that we proposed earlier with the enablers listed on the previous slide, we foresee that investors required rate of return can be lowered, reducing the cost of capital for sell side enterprises. Next slide, please, Felipe. In summary, it's evident that there are different models that are being trialed across various different business structures each within sectors, different sectors across different geographies. This represents a challenge for financial aggregation more generally, and requires a which usually requires a degree of uniformity and standardization of receivables as a basis for transparency and modeling. However, as the market grows, it will likely follow a very similar path to other ABS markets, which initially had many different 
initial offerings that over time converged towards a common standard where several barriers were reduced through a mixture of market-based solutions and public sector reforms. It was clear that local cell site actors see an abundance of opportunities available, but really need buy side expertise to help develop their businesses and access superior financing options. The predominant issue from the buy side is scale, with executed deals currently being fairly small in size, suggesting that meaningful investment may only materialize if current barriers are reduced. This type of disconnect between each side of the financing equation can only really be overcome through better collaboration between investors, financial intermediaries, and the DRE sector in itself. The case studies featured in the report revealed an important insight showing the value of blended finance in allocating risk to the most appropriate financing parties. This is likely to be an essential feature in any proposed financial aggregation vehicle. Overall, there has been an increase in off-balance sheet financing in the past few years, yet thematic debt instruments are yet to gain traction in the DRE sector. This suggests that the global thematic debt market is far from reaching its full potential in developing countries, but particularly for small-scale renewable energy. Unlocking finance opportunities using a sophisticated mechanism in a highly complex, fragmented sector housed in an underdeveloped capital market is a challenging undertaking. There are only a few instances where this potential idea has really been turned into a reality. However, there are promising signs, developments, and tremendous work that continues to be done by many in the sector, including UNDP. There's also a broad consensus from many on the buy and the sell side that financial aggregation of great, holds great potential for the sector in the future. Thanks, Felipe, and back to you, Shamini. Thank you, Dan, for sharing those findings. What I heard was um, the $200 billion market opportunity and the collaboration being critical to sort of seize that, seize that opportunity. And IEA actually last week um, released the World Investment Report and some of their findings corroborates the things that you just mentioned. For example, the most worrying trend that they mentioned from their analysis was the relative weakness of clean energy investment flows to much of the developing world. So the need for innovative financial instruments is just so apparent. Um, and on that note, I'd like to bring together experts who've contributed insights to the report to hear from them about financial aggregation and its potential. So I'd like to start off by introducing my colleague, Eduardo Apliad. Eduardo is a Berlin-based international consultant with nearly two decades of experience, most of which in the energy and climate sectors, predominantly in sub-Saharan Africa. He currently manages UNDP's climate aggregation platform. Prior to that, he worked as energy finance expert with the United Nations Capital Development Fund, supporting early stage innovations for SMEs, financial institutions, and other providers of wholesale or retail financing for clean energy in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. And it's my pleasure to welcome Christine Eve Singer. And Christine works in energy access, um, and her work is focused on the intersection of public and private finance. As an independent consultant, Christine's advisory clients include the Rockefeller Foundation and the International Renewable Agency. She's also a senior advisor with Catalyst Energy Advisors and a technical advisor to the Kenyan Ministry of Energy for the Kenyan Off-Grid Solar Access Program. She's also a co-founder of E Plus Co, a pioneer in energy enterprise development and blended capital investment. Ambassador Emeritus of C3E Women in Energy Initiative, an Ashton Award International Judge, and an independent member of GOGLA. Welcome to all of you. Um, thank you for joining us. So let me start off with a question to Eduardo. We've heard quite a bit about the climate aggregation platform. Tell us more about that and how this report and the platform is shaping UNDP's work on financial aggregation. Thank you, uh, Shamini. 
Yes, the, the, as you mentioned earlier, the, the Climate Aggregation Platform is a, a global environment facility funded project that's implemented by UNDP in partnership with the Climate Bonds Initiative. Uh, and it seeks to promote uh, financial aggregation for small scale low carbon energy assets in developing countries as a means to increase access to and lower the cost of capital uh, for the sector. But more specifically, it seeks to advance and raise awareness for innovative solutions to market barriers for financial aggregation. Uh, the project has a global offer, which focuses on awareness raising, networking, and knowledge products such as this one we're launching today, and an in-country offer, initially uh, focusing uh, on Uganda and Rwanda, and hopefully we'll be able to expand that, uh, which focuses on, on market development activities and supporting the development of innovative financial aggregation structures and models, which can hopefully lead to financially closed transactions in the future. In terms of the, the report, I must say that the process of developing it in itself was very instructive. Uh, it really helped us uh, stay, uh, take stock of the sector, um, undertake a much needed update of the knowledge around financial aggregation in, in distributed renewable energy, and engage with a wide range of uh, stakeholders. Um, so that in itself had great value for us. Uh, but I think that the, the key learning from it is that while there is a broad interest in financial aggregation and its potential, uh, and there have been promising developments in recent years, notably in relation to digital solutions, some innovative uh, financial structures involving off balance sheet uh, financing and uh, special, purpose special purpose vehicles being set up in a few transactions we've seen, uh, we are still in the early days. And... Um, it is likely to remain a challenging uh, undertaking to, to promote financial aggregation. So uh, this has highlighted the need for the CAP project to work further upstream uh, to address, to identify and address uh, key barriers and to support the design and development of, of novel financial aggregation structures and models that can hopefully at some point lead to, to uh, transactions and, and um, tap into new sources of capital for the sector. Uh, but we have to acknowledge that um, this, the early stage of the market development and um, implementing sophisticated uh, financial uh, innovation, such as financial aggregation, uh, will require time, technical assistance, and innovation to take place. I think one other thing that's, that's very important is that the report has highlighted some of the most prominent barriers uh, that need to be addressed for financial aggregation uh, transactions to really take shape in certain markets, but in reality, a uh, more in-depth assessment is required to better understand the specificities of specific geographies or subsectors. Um, and this is work that we are currently undertaking uh, with the CAP project. Finally, I should say that it has also highlighted the need for uh, greater uh, collaboration across the different actors in the sector from the buy side, the sell side, and, and the, the development partners that are involved in a variety of initiatives supporting access to finance for, for the energy sector. And um, I believe that um, we need more synergy and coordination. And this is something that is a requirement for us to, to come up with the solutions which are uh, prerequisites for financial aggregation, namely promoting standardization, uh, promoting uh, new innovative uh, financial models that can be replicated in new markets. And therefore, I think this report is also a call for um, further engaging with the sector and the CAP intends to be a platform to do that um, within UNDP. Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo, for sharing some of the pioneering work that the Climate Aggregation Platform is doing. Now, my next question is to Christine. I want to draw on your vast experience in this sector. We just heard that one of the findings in the report is that financial aggregation holds great potential. You know, Dan's mentioned it, Eduardo has mentioned it, um, to unlock new for sources of capital and help address some of the key market impediments. Uh, but the sector is at a relatively early stage and it may still be premature to consider financial aggregation a viable option in most markets. How do you reconcile those two things and what role do you see for financial aggregation in the energy sector, energy access sector rather? Great, thank you Shalmini for the question and I appreciate the invitation to be here uh, to join. I, I have to say I, I'm quite pleased with 
this issue being on the, the agenda of the Climate Bonds Initiative, I had an opportunity eight to nine years ago to speak with Sean Kidney and say, okay, well, when are we gonna take this to the small scale? When are we actually gonna shift? So we're looking at decentralized renewables. And so that's one area that I'm, I'm quite excited about this report really positioning. The second is positioning it within the climate aggregation platform. One of the main issues often in dealing with decentralized renewables is to place it in climate. Uh, often the aggregation of these smaller scale initiatives doesn't necessarily lead to significant mitigation uh, or significant uh, you know, decreases when you're looking at solar home systems. But when you begin to expand that and really look at adaptation and resiliency, and I love the fact that some of Daniel's experience is low carbon and resilience, we really need to be looking at these small scale uh, decentralized renewables in the context of adaptation and resiliency as well. So I think the elevation of decentralized renewable projects and enterprises on the cap with the Climate Bonds Initiative is, is really an important placement, if you will. So I, I welcome the report and, the, and really the understanding of this within that context. To your question of the role of financial aggregation, certainly aggregation is necessary to bring these small investments and enterprises and projects into a place that can be investable. But I really liked the, the insights and conclusions slide that Daniel put out there to start. First is the early stage. I think the important recognition that this is one tool, this could be one tool in the toolbox uh, is, a, is a really important thing to understand because if you're not, if you don't have equity, there's a reference in the report to equity. If you don't have the capacity of your local domestic, uh, you know, employees and leadership, all of those things are an important requirement. So this is one element, this financial aggregation tool is one element in a bigger suite of investments that we have to look at, which Eduardo mentioned the the cap is also going to be looking at this overall market development piece. So the financial aggregation is key. And I think one of the areas that we need to look at, and perhaps the cap will be looking at this, is how successful has though, have those uh, investments that have been made to date actually been? How is the BBOX securitization going? How is the, the CEPI that was referenced in the report, the Sustainable Energy Finance Initiative of SunFunder, how is that actually working? And what are the lessons learned that we can extrapolate from that? Because clearly we need to aggregate, there's no question. Uh, clearly we need to get down to local enterprises and local project developers. Uh, so what's the role of financial aggregation? It's critical whether the asset backed security tool will be the, the linchpin that unlocks the rest of the toolbox is still, is still to be determined. But clearly looking at how these other pieces line up in a finance continuum that can leverage this sort of capital clearly has to be on the agenda of financial innovation and grant makers to really look at how do we make this move faster. We only have seven years. The report is clearly stating that this is complex. So we need to look at it, but we need to look at it in the context of how do we move everything forward to Stephanie's point to make sure that we leave no one behind. I could keep going because there were so many points in the report, but, but let me stop there. Thank you, Christine, for bringing in all of the different pieces and, and sharing, share, you know, presenting a much clearer picture of what's really needed and also framing it in, in, in the adaptation and resiliency frame, which I think often gets forget, forgotten. So Daniel, my question, my next question is to you and, you know, in terms of climate bonds initiatives work in the energy access and distributed renewable energy space is relatively new. Uh, but do you see the parallels between this sector and more developed ones that have similar trajectory and challenges in early days, but are now thriving. Yeah, sure. Um, I think the yeah the parallels are evident in terms of most financial markets. When you have a new idea, will have some degree of teething issues. There will be a sense that even if the idea is 
something that is established elsewhere. It may not necessarily be transplanted in its entirety into a new context such that it is therefore something that is um, achieving what it needs to do. It needs time in terms of how it is going to evolve and how people are going to innovate on particular ideas. And frankly, along the way, there's going to be failures in terms of how you actually go about things, but that's a part of the learning process. And I think that that is something that will happen in this context, but it is something that happens in most other financial markets in every different asset class that uh, is currently now established or well-established uh, globally. So it's, if you want to take it into the context of climate bonds as well, I think the same thing can be said sort of within the last decade where people weren't sure what a green bond was at one point in time. They weren't sure how it worked, how it differed from more traditional conventional bonds and these sorts of things. And it's taken organisations like the climate bonds to actually try to actually help others to understand this, to build out various different resources and tools such that it can help the various different stakeholders to understand what is required for this to work, what are the key considerations that may need to be taken into account. And I think that that's going to be necessary in terms of how financial aggregation will work. Um, I think Christine raised, raised a really good point in that there's, and I, I would direct people to the, the report quite frankly, because it's conceptually or theoretically, it's a, a simple idea. Uh, but the reality is you have to get into the weeds, you have to get into the detail to really understand how this is going to work and how an idea that may be thriving, say in the US, won't necessarily be able to be mirrored in this context. It's parts of it will, but there will be a need to, to give it its own flavor. And I think that that will be a necessary progress in terms of how this evolves and develops over time. Thank you. So going from that, the next question, actually, I think I'd like to pose to both you and Christine. Um, in And essentially, you know, I think there are some references made to this already, but this is a fast evolving sector. And just in the first half of 2022, there have been some really great developments. Uh, for example, the announcement of the 238 million multi-currency receivable finance facility which is one of the largest off-balance sheet financing facilities of its kind for the PAYGO operations industry in Africa, um, several acquisitions, and another $260 million funding round for a market leader. What do these developments mean for the industry in terms of trends and opportunities? We say that there's challenges, but there seems to be all these great announcements. So, um, Christine, do you want to take that first? Oh, I'd love to. How much time do I have? You you can um, take, I, but if you go over time, I will intervene. So please don't okay. feel like you need to censor yourself. Uh, I mean, the first point is it's great news. There's no question that, and let's be real, those are two, two of the leaders uh, in the report. They actually make reference to the fact that the top three companies get something like 68% of all of the financing. Well, the, those two are in the top three of those companies, of, of that number, right? So that is great news for the sector. A couple of concerns come from that, though, quite clearly. One is, does it communicate that the problem is solved and that the rest of the capital is moving upstream into mini grids and, and grid connected renewables? There is some real concern in the sector about that, that we don't need the same level of investment because look at the, what we're being able to achieve. I can see Ed, Eduardo looking at me a little skeptically, but unfortunately, that is really what we're hearing when we talk about solar home systems at the tier one and the tier two first time access. Capital's coming in, $2 billion. We're showing these companies work, problem solved. Let's move on to the next problem, mini grids or productive use or, or, or. The second concern that I raise with that is these are very well regarded, very strongly professionally managed companies with great leadership, great intentions, but they're international companies. Where, when you start looking at where are the local enterprises, where are the companies that are owned and managed by local, in this context, local African entrepreneurs, a very small percentage of the capital goes there. And this is where you begin to hit those areas that are referenced in the port, in the report and called domestic expertise. And this is where these issues of capacity building and technical assistance and patient capital 
and most importantly, equity come into play. And what we're seeing across uh, the continent, quite frankly, is a diminishment of the equity that actually is available going into these smaller companies. And for there to be the type of aggregation, standardization data that comes from a growing solar home system or a growing mini grid space, we need to be investing in these companies as well to ensure that you begin to have the, the um, viability of an investable pipeline, which was, is mentioned numerous times in the report as really critical to the ability to aggregate. A couple of other minor points that I'd like to just leave on the table. In addition to really making the point I made earlier about that we need to assess how the existing financial aggregation vehicles of SunFunder and BVOX and others, are they, how are they working? Because one of the best ingredients of de-risking is evidence of what works. And so really understanding what those, what's happening and are the investors happy and are they getting, you know, are they getting the returns they expected? And as importantly, are the customers getting the, the energy access solutions that have been promised, promised and are they happy as well? The, the report is quite clear that it doesn't go into productive uses, uh, productive use of renewable energy. And clearly there's a reason for that because of focus. But there is a good bit of work underway now around asset-based financing within the productive use sector that may be quite interesting for the climate aggregation platform to also begin to follow. And I, I, you know, there's a program in Uganda called Energro, which is doing asset-based financing of productive use appliances. There's a great bit, bit of work coming out of CLASP and Nithio, which is Nithio being referenced in the report, focused on the, the financing of productive use appliances on the back of the Nithio data and digitalization algorithms. So you're starting to see some synergies in that as well that may be good to be watching, uh, particularly if you're seeing those distribution companies also being distribution companies who are distributing solar home systems and energy, if you will, household access. Going to Stephanie's remarks at the very beginning, we need to ensure that we leave no one behind. And there is a concern about how first-time access and households may begin to be slightly neglected as we push to larger scale systems and push to productive uses. Um, the last point that I wanna make, and, and then I really will stop, is um, the comment about collaboration among investors, intermediaries in the DRE sector and a mutual appreciation, I think was the wording in the, in the last slide, I wrote it quickly. I think that's really important because often we're hearing what the supply side needs. The supply side of capital needs A, B, C, it needs this type of thing, that type of thing. What I also think becomes really important in this mutual appreciation is understanding what, what's called in this report, the sell side needs. How does an, a results-based financing facility fit with some early stage equity, fit with the potential of thematic um, or, or special purpose vehicle type of debt, uh, green bond debt? So I think there is that, there really is a need for there to be a mutual listen, listening exchange. Because often I fear we very much bring the supply side of what the capital needs. And if we're going to innovate, we also need to then understand what does the market need? So thank you, I'll stop there. Thank you for connecting all of those dots. Daniel, you know, how do you follow that? <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I, I don't have too much more to add to what Christine actually said. I think that what is clear that is the recent developments are very promising. Um, I think that what I learned in the, over the course of trying to conduct the research for this though, is that there historically have been uh, announcements, press releases, and these sorts of things that have sounded tremendously promising, but trying to find greater detail on how they evolved and how they've had impacts and their successes and or failures is very difficult to ascertain. 
Um, so I think that what that's not to suggest that any any initiative that's trying to actually push this agenda forward is a worthwhile initiative to to uh, pursue. Let let me not discredit it in that way. But to Christina's point is that it's really actually important that there's a bit more transparency and a bit more documentation around how things are actually going. Um, talking with people um, and those who are actually directly involved at the various different stages of the financing chain gives you different insights into what their perspectives are. Um, and to, the, to their credit, um, for instance, in the report, SunFunder does a really good job of detailing uh, a particular deal that they had executed, the challenges that they faced, the recommendations that they think, and the lessons learned from that exercise. And that's really what I found is a bit of a template. They're not the only ones who do this, I might add, but um, more of that sort of activity, I think, around ideas and developments and then how they are executed and what we learn from it is really what's going to benefit everyone over the long term. And to, to Christine's point as well, um, I think giving that, really thinking about investment as the true sense of the word, not just deploying capital for the sake of gaining return or achieving an SDG, but looking at these businesses and investing in the actual architecture and the structure of these businesses to create something that is of value and that will produce value for the people they serve and the people who invest in them. And that involves making sure we can talk about things like data, we can talk about standardization, but you need to have the infrastructure so that they are capable of delivering on that. I think the appetite is there, the know-how may not be. And I think that investment involves the hard work behind actually making sure that that is something that can be executed. I think that these are additional things that aren't immediately obvious, but in conversations, if you talk to enough people about it, they become really towards the heart of the issue. Um, and I think that more conversations in that, uh, in that vein would benefit everyone. So. Thanks, Dan. Both yours and Christine's point on the support to the local ecosystem is, is definitely resonating, I feel, with our audience because I see some comments with regard to that in, in the Q&A section. Um, so, oh, Eduardo, I'm going to ask the last question to you. Um, with all of these fast-moving developments, what is the climate aggregation platform planning to do next? I think Christine offered some suggestions, but in terms of you know, what is currently in the pipeline, are there specific country-level projects, examples that you want to share in, in terms of what you are doing and where you're going next? Thank you. And just before that, I'd like, I'd like to say uh, that, uh, Christine, you raised a very good point there around, you know, broadening the scope to, to beyond off-grid solar, mini-grids, et cetera. And, and I'm happy to say that the CAP really has that broad uh, perspective. And we're really even looking at other types of um, so productive use appliances, even, even clean cooking. The clean cooking space could benefit for, from such approaches, uh, CNI, e-mobility. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we're very much open to that. Um, and I do, I do uh, echo some of the, the comments you made earlier, actually. So my, my look was one of approval, perhaps, <laughs> more than skepticism. I, I should say that uh, on the CAP project side, maybe I would highlight a few points, and then I will invite uh, uh, participants to 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 uh, go on the the, the soon to be updated uh, cap website and and to reach out to us via email. We'll share contact details at the end of the presentation, uh, and I'll be very happy. We'll be very happy to provide more details. But one thing that I think I want to highlight is that we're currently working on uh, developing a framework uh, to help assess uh, a given market and a given sector um, its readiness for financial aggregation and really try to. Uh, understand what are the key barriers that that sector is facing, what are the precursors that need to be there, and what are the key enablers and opportunities that exist. And, and we, we did that kind of in response also to, to, to the findings of this report that we need to look more in detail at specific markets for us to really define our interventions. The, the CAP is intended to be a global project, but with a very in-country focus um, set of interventions. And therefore, we are planning to launch very soon uh, in-depth market assessments for Uganda and Rwanda, which will be followed by action plans uh, proposing a menu of different market development solutions 
uh, to help um, develop the sector into specific markets. And finally, we'll be implementing some pilot market development activities in those markets. And hopefully we'll be able to replicate this model in other, in other countries and regions as well. And finally, um, we will also be looking at identifying and supporting the development of, of some um, innovative um, financial aggregation structures and models uh, as well. And I'll, I will be sharing more information on that in, in, the, in the weeks to come, but that's another area of work uh, that is quite interesting. And finally, perhaps to briefly, uh, we're also currently looking at, at uh, some alternative models and, and ways to, to connect uh, this sector with climate finance, with renewable energy certificates, with other sources of revenue for the space. And where we're, we have a partnership in place, UNDP has a partnership in place with the DIRIC initiative. And we're currently working on a pilot project in Uganda. We're hoping to uh, use uh, distributed renewable energy certificates as a means to uh, raise additional revenues for uh, to ensure the sustainability of um, electrification projects for, for public facilities, namely healthcare facilities in the country. So uh, we're doing some exciting work and we encourage you to, to reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo. Looking forward to following along and finding out the more exciting things that you and the CAP project are going to be doing. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank all our panelists, Christine, Dan, Eduardo, for the insights that you've shared and for sh sharing your time with us this morning. Um, I'd now like to invite Krista Tukianen, um, market Head of Market Intelligence at Climate Bonds Initiative, um, to deliver closing remarks. Krista oversees the global research pipeline of the Climate Bonds Market Intelligence Team. Um, she is an environmental economist by training and has experience from cross-sector advisory projects. Uh, she previously worked as a consultant at the University of Cambridge's Center for Sustainable Development, followed by an ESG advisory role at London-based boutique firm Longevity Partners. She's also collaborated with impact-driven companies and investors in advisory capacity, including Silvera Limited, a startup using machine learning to identify and carry out large-scale carbon sequestration projects, as well as UK-based VC fund ECA Ventures in helping to define their investment thesis and their measurement approach. Krista, over to you. We can't hear you. Hello, my name is Krista Dukanen. I'm the head of market intelligence at the Climate Bonds Initiative. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to join this webinar in person or indeed live, but would like to share some thoughts as closing remarks to this discussion and to say thank you for joining us today. As has been reiterated by the panel, access to finance is critical to enabling clean energy deployment. The work we currently do at the Climate Bonds Initiative focuses predominantly on the thematic debt market, which is a market that's already enabled trillions to be channeled towards green and social projects through a variety of different types of instruments. Despite the impressive growth in this market segment, some barriers do remain before it can reach its tremendous potential, especially in emerging markets and for financing smaller scale projects, the combination of which is obviously the focus of the report launched today. Within the green bond market, which is the largest in the sustainable debt or GSS plus universe of instruments, renewable energy is perhaps the clearest low carbon asset type and also the most funded use proceeds category globally. However, the issue is that most of this financing is aimed at large scale infrastructure projects with high capital expenditure needs. Smaller scale clean energy projects are less common and within that distributed renewable energy has been almost non-existent both through green securitizations as well as regular green bonds. Now, against this backdrop, we know that financial aggregation is the key to be able to bridge the gap between global capital markets and distributed renewable energy generation and access. To crack this could mean enormous benefits to large swathes of the global population, enabling the development of distributed clean energy assets at a scale and cost of capital never seen before. By opening the doors to pooling of assets in this way, including through securitization, it could also pave the way for capital markets financing other activities that currently lack access to suitable funding. This could then support the thematic debt market in delivering its full potential as the world urgently transitions to a low carbon and sustainable economy. 
And as reflected by the case studies that were included in this report, there are already encouraging signs that first movers are innovating towards making these types of solutions possible. But the sector as a whole doesn't appear ready to embrace the type of approach just yet. Given this context and also the prevailing general market issues that we're all experiencing, it may be too soon to view financial aggregation for distributed renewable energy and other small scale low carbon energy solutions as a viable option in many early stage markets current stage, but the potential is undoubtedly there. We'd say that this market could then perhaps be best described by the idea, idea of liminality and in line with broader developments in the markets uh, for sustainable finance transition. Okay, thank you, Krista. Um, so that, in a sense, brings our event to a close. And I just want to end with saying the lack of progress on SDG 7 is a global challenge. And to rise to that challenge, we need disruptive change, innovation, and now more than ever, collaboration and scaled up partnerships. The Climate Aggregation Platform is an example of the leading work that we are doing at the UNDP Sustainable Energy Hub which is an all of UNDP initiative bringing together the best talent, innovations, partnerships, and finance to accelerate the clean energy transition and close the energy access gap. As you know, with our collaboration with the Climate Bonds Initiative, we stand ready to collaborate to achieve our energy goals of the 2030 agenda. If you have any questions to the authors or to the climate aggregation platform, you can contact, um, contact them. The email will come up at the end of this event as we close. And uh, there will also be a QR code which you can scan, which will take you to the report. Um, and so I hope you have an opportunity to read that. Um, with that, uh, I will bring our event to a close. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you to our panelists, to Stephanie, Christine, Dan, and Eduardo, and to the Climate Bonds team, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Take care.